Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Raising Good Parents. I am really excited today because I am talking about middle schoolers with Michelle Eichard, and she has written a new book that I happen to have a copy of, and I'm trying to get it on the screen. There we go. 14 Talks by Age 14. And in this book, she talks about the essential conversations you need to have with your kids before they start high school. And knowing a little bit about you and your background, Michelle, you really focus in on those middle school years. And so as we get started, I'd love to learn from you, like your your background and what led you to choose, because there's so many different age groups that you could uh, become a parenting expert and contributor and writer about. How did you hone in on that? And just tell us a little bit of background about you. Sure. So I was certified to teach seventh through 12th grade and thought I might be a teacher and ended up getting a job out of college uh, with a consulting firm. Um, and really, I, I thought, oh, like more money, this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and realized that everything I did in that position, I was desperately trying to turn into a teaching job. Okay. So I would say, oh, I think we need a training manual for this. Or could I, could I r run something to explain how this works to people? So I always felt like I wanted to teach, um, even as I sort of resisted it at certain points of my career. Um, right. But what happened was famously, I, I worked for Arthur Anderson and they folded with the Enron scandal. And at that time, I had a little one, not quite two. I was pregnant with a seven month old. I thought, well, I get no maternity leave now and who will hire me? Right. Um, right. Walking in the door, seven months pregnant. So um, I had to reinvent myself. And I, I knew that I loved teaching based on my experience, even there in the corporate world. So I started my own tutoring business that would be flexible okay. with my little young growing family. I was coaching kids who were mostly in middle school at the time, and I just fell in love with that age group. And they were talking to me a lot about what was happening with them socially, and I could see how that was impacting what was happening to them academically. Mm. And so I just became captivated and, and just dove into research and creating programs around that age group. And, and it's been 15 years that I've been doing that since. I mean, it's such an important age group because it's really like a, a transitional age group. And I, I feel like there's a lot of like young child information out there. There's a lot of like high school issues, but then you kind of get into that middle range and it's, it's a time when a lot of things are changing. And so this book is, I think, just like the perfect time to talk through all of those different things that are going on and really the transition from elementary school to, to middle school and high school is a really big time and in, in a formidable time. And so it's I just massive. wanna, oh my gosh, yes. Um, and I know that you have the book, the, the Middle School Makeover, but this I really like, and I'm just gonna talk about the different conversations because I think it's so helpful for, for parents to get an idea if they're thinking about this book or what conversations do I need to have? You talk about the parent-child relationship and independence, changing friendships, creativity, taking care of yourself, fairness, technology, criticism, hard work, money, sexuality, reputations, impulsivity, and helping others. And those are all important conversations. And I feel like they are things that we want to have that conversation with our, our teen about, but oftentimes we're a little bit worried about how to have that conversation or what we need to cover or what we need to avoid, you know, exposing right. them to accidentally, or, I mean, there's just so many different layers to that. So having this as kind of a guidebook and like the scripts of, of how to actually go about doing that is so helpful. What, what do you think if, if I'm, my oldest is uh, 11 and I'm approaching that age, before I even get into these conversations, where should a parent start in forming that relationship where, where your child is able to be open to you and you're able to be open and, and to have these conversations? Because I feel like if you, if you really haven't laid the groundwork, but you sit down and you say, okay, today we're gonna talk about technology. Um, right. Here's what I want you to know about technology. Then it's not gonna go well. So how would you advise parents that are, that are approaching this book or age group to, to kind of set the groundwork? I think it's so smart that you made that distinction and, and you're exactly right. If you 
If you rip out the um, table of contents and pin it to your billboard and you think, aha, today is technology and I will say these words <laughs> and check, I'm done. Right. And tomorrow will be money and boom, good. Um, it certainly does not work that way. The, the book itself is really meant to help build that foundation that you're talking about. Um, it's less about knowing the right words. It's less about being perfect and saying the right thing and far more about building a rapport and a relationship where your kid knows they can come to you. Um, my entire purpose and hope in writing the book is that when your kid is older, when they're in high school, if they find themselves in a position where they feel helpless or hopeless or confused or angry or they've made a mistake, whatever it may be, that they know I can go to my mom or dad or my caregiver, whoever has read this book for me, and they won't freak out when I tell them this. They won't judge me. So part of the groundwork comes through these conversations themselves. But um, but even to back it up a little bit further, I think a big piece of the groundwork is just in having a real gentle curiosity about your kid. Um, I think one of the most important things we can say to ourselves as parents is you get the kid you get, right? Like mm -hmm. every kid is going to have a different personality and be right. a different person from you, from their siblings, from their community maybe sometimes. And we think, but it's my job to teach and mold and create and make this kid turn out the way they should. And that's true in part. Your job is to be a teacher, but your job isn't to be a a maker. You can't really make mm. your kid do stuff. So I think that the very beginning foundational piece is to say, hmm, this is the interesting kid I got. What a surprise. <laughs> this kid is a little different than I was, a little different than I expected. Right. And now I'm going to have a lot of curiosity about this child because they are really unique. Every kid is. So that's my hope. I like that approach because I mean, I think there's a lot of parents out there that want their child to like the things that they liked as a child. And why don't you like soccer more? And why don't you like Star Wars as much as I do? And or they want their child to not turn out like them and avoid those certain things when in reality it will go much smoother for you as a parent and for your child. If you're willing to say, huh, that's interesting. You really like uh, Lego. And I really never was super into Lego. What do you like about Lego so much? Rather than trying to say, don't you want to go play soccer? No, I want to I want to make Legos. Okay, but don't you want to go kick the ball around? Like, that's what, that's what I did with my dad. And I had a lot of fun. Okay, but I want to do Lego. Do you want to do Lego with me? And just being open and, and curious about that and, and being willing to accept your child rather than trying to make them into a soccer star because that's what you want them to be or had the aspirations for them to be. There was a, uh, there's a show on Netflix called Seven Days Out. Have you heard of it? Hmm. Okay. It's a, it's an amazing documentary and it, it chronicles major events around the globe and the seven days that lead up to them. Mm. And I think it has one of the best examples of parenting I've seen on TV. And it's, I think his name is Rick Fox. He's a famous basketball player. I'm not a huge basketball fan, but he's hugely known. <laughs> and okay. <laughs> his son hated basketball. His son mm. loves video games. So Rick Fox was like, okay, I'm going to really dive deep into video games. And he's a very wealthy man. He ended up buying some kind of eSport thing and has, you know, really got behind his kid in eSports. And I thought, this is what we need to be doing. Your kid, Rick Fox's kid, is not going to become a basketball player no matter what he tries or what he does. So to your point, I think that that's really crucial to get into our kids' worlds. And it doesn't mean you have to love it, too. Like, I mean, you can just show up and then have... I think if, if you're going to have these conversations with your child, they're going to be much more open to it if they're doing the things that they want to do rather than, like, you force them to do soccer or basketball because you loved that. And then on the ride home, you want to talk to them about, you know, criticism and making good choices and those sorts of things. Well, I'm probably going to be kind of annoyed with you and probably not as open as if you're sitting on the ground playing Lego with them because they like that or connecting with them, you know, while they're playing their video games or whatever they like to do. Uh, they're going to be more open to you, I imagine, if, if you're willing to accept the things that they like and the person that they are. Not only that, they will be more willing to try the things that you like if you go first. So sure. even though they may be like, I don't like soccer, if you play Legos with them enough, then ultimately they may be like, okay, we can do your thing now. So you right. do have to sort of like 
like buy into it a little bit. And then they they often reciprocate, which is nice. For sure. I always want my kids to play chess and they never want to play chess with me. And I've stopped trying to convince them to play chess and I kind of just try and do what they want to do. And then I'm like, hey, you know, what do you think about playing chess? And they're like, okay, sure. Um, and then they'll be much more like that than we're going to sit down at the table and we're going to play chess because I want to play chess. It, it goes better if you are willing to, to be the leader of uh, doing what the other person wants and then they'll follow uh, your lead, hopefully, eventually, and, and let you, you know, get a game of chess in every now and then. Yes, yes, totally. <laughs> Now, um, when we're approaching these talks, I mean, clearly it's not something that you can do when you, you can't just sit down and say, like you were saying, you can't, today we're going to have the technology talk, that it's going to be something that you integrate into your everyday conversation. Do you have any strategies to make it feel like you're not always um, being prescriptive as a parent? Like this is what you need to do and this is how you need to think about this and this is demands and commands that I'm going to put upon you regarding technology or hard work or attention or impulsivity or whatever it might be? Yes. And I love that question because I think approach is probably the most important part of the process. So I have in the book what I call the brief model, and it's a universal five-step way that you can begin any of these conversations so that they don't sound like you said, like um, a to-do list. (laughs) <laughs> um, the, the B or PowerPoint. Is, here's what we're, yes, we're yes. going to talk about today. This is what we're going to cover. Exactly. Point number one is this, and this is why it works. And I've then given point you number a worksheet, and you can take notes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so most parents, I think at this age, kids starting at around age 11, they start the process of becoming independent from their parents. And that sounds funny to parents of little kids, but it it's like a 10-year process. You know, It takes a long sure. time, but they're just starting that at that age. So um, language is often one of the first things to be sacrificed. I say in the book, it's the job of language to tie groups of people together. And it's the job of tweens and teens to break ties apart so that they Mm. can sort of go out on their own. And so they cut down on communication. And incidentally, it's why they they pick up on slang with their friends, because it's a way of saying, I am with this group now. You can't even understand us, what we're talking about. Right. Okay. So... So to begin your conversation, um, most parents will say, gosh, I have like 30 seconds before my kid picks up their phone or tunes me out or whatever. So I better start hard and fast and cram in some advice really quickly. That never works. The brief (laughs) model takes you through the first step is B and that's begin peacefully. And that can sound a couple ways. One that kids really seem to like is um, scheduling a time to talk because your kid is an impulsive thinker. They haven't had time like you have to think ahead on the subject. They don't know what you're gonna bring up. So they can get defensive if you just say, I think it's time to talk about grades, right? <laughs> then right. That, that's a that's a non-starter for them. But you might say, hey, we haven't done a grade check in a while. Why don't we touch base? Do you wanna talk after dinner or would you like to wait until bedtime? So if you give your kid a heads up, that's a peaceful way to start. Another oh, I love that, okay. Do, I have to, I have to, chime in at that because that is such a helpful thing for honestly for every conversation because with with adults with partners with coworkers, with with whomever is is this a good time to talk or how about we talk about it then because then i can mentally prepare we're my wife and i are in the process of of building a new home right now and oh. it goes much smoother when it's like hey can we talk about um window treatments tonight at eight o'clock rather than what do you think about this window treatment like for me it's hard to like frame shift so if you're doing that for your child I'm sure all the better I love that idea and I hadn't hadn't considered that before but the the mental wheels were turning when it was like yeah it goes much better when I can like prepare in advance to talk about those things and know what the topic is a bit completely and I can remember my father who is has a lot of strong opinions and a lot of strong opinions about politics talking to me when I was a teenager and bringing something up and I would get furious because I would think I know you've read a bunch of articles and you are fully prepared and you knew we were going to talk about this. And I am just like, uh, I was watching TV. I don't know. I have no idea. Right. So, um, so that's one way to begin peacefully. Another way to launch into these conversations is to be very tangential about the topic. So if your kid is always begging you to go to the mall and they don't want you to be there and they just want to go with friends who you may or may not know, but you need to stay far away. Let's say this is starting to come up for you. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe not right now in the middle of a pandemic, but s- sort of similar. We all want to go to the park and, you know, right. you don't need to know who's going and you don't need to be there, <laughs> um, which is a normal thing to begin sure. happening at this age. Rather than just beginning with, okay, here are the park rules. You might begin with something slightly related to the park. Did you see that they're putting in a new slide down at the park? So it's like, sounds a little contrived, but it's a way to <laughs> Gently lead in rather than diving deep into the cold water. So right. both of those tend to work better than just I like that. a heavy. Yeah. So uh, we talked about the B. Mm. Okay, then, so as what... we go through this process, then the next step is the R in brief, and R is relate. And that's an opportunity for you to show your kid that you are on the same page. You're not having this conversation because you're suspicious or you want to bust them or you think something's wrong. So you could say something like, um, I know it's never fun to talk about grades or uh, I know it's weird to talk to your parents about sex sometimes, but I'm going to make this kind of quick and simple and, and you know, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll just get through it and it'll be fine. So anything that indicates that you are on their team and you sense how they feel, whatever mm. that might be, and acknowledging that is a good way to show I relate to you right now. Right. Um, the I is interview for data. And this is where you can ask questions. But these questions are really meant to be uh, a way to help gauge your child's understanding on a subject and less um, sort of probing for personal information. That's where your kid will shut down. So mm. if you are asking questions like, well, which of your friends are also getting bad grades? And have you noticed, if, are any of your friends cheating? Like, is that a big thing? So if you're... Your kid's gonna be very loyal to protect their own privacy and their friend's privacy, no matter the subject. So I would not recommend diving in with questions that are personal, but more questions about what is your understanding about this subject? Let's say we're sure. talking about grades. Let's say grades right. came out and they are not what you expected. You might say, at what point did you notice that your grades were slipping? Mm. What did you think would happen when I got the grades? How? What was your, did you have any plan or reaction to how you might talk about this with the teacher. So just kind of gentle probing. Uh, E is echo. This is where, you know, like any good therapist would do, you say, okay, it sounds like you sort of felt like your grades were slipping. You didn't know that they were quite this bad, but you also think maybe it was the teacher's fault. Am I getting that right? So you're just Mm -hmm. assessing for where they are. And then the F is feedback. And this is the moment that parents usually begin with the moment they can't wait to get to it's where right. you can give some advice give some suggestions and if you need to you can put boundaries and limitations in place but you've you've got to with a kid who's pulling away you've got to sort of earn your way to that moment instead mm. of starting there and that's what the model gets you i really i love that because the, like you said people want, parents want to start with that because their kid's going to tune them out if they you know Otherwise, or they're worried that their child is not going to listen or they're going to go back to their phone or their AirPods or whatever it might be. And so they have to start with the the punchline, which is that feedback where we have to make a change or solve a problem or something like that. Um, And instead, you build to that moment. And that's something that I think that I am pretty good at doing in my practice when talking with teens is going through essentially what you just did there. And like, like one thing that I will try and get at, you know, for example, um, is kind of trying to get them to say, yeah, this does suck. And so I'll start with like, wow, hasn't this year really sucked? And then immediately they let their guard down rather than like, I'm going to tell them, you know, you need to do this and this and this. It's just like, oh my gosh, he gets it. Like this year has really sucked because there was a pandemic and masks and I haven't been able to see my friends and everything like that. And he said sucked. Like I didn't know that doctors right. would, would, would talk like that. Um, but, but, but having those opening up the conversation in a way that makes them see that you get it. Or I like the tangential part too, in that if I'm trying to to figure out if if a child like we talk about um, smoking and those sorts of things rather than saying do you do you vape um, because the answer can be no like first of all they're in front of their parents and all those sorts of things and even if I want to just tell them like vaping isn't healthy or something like that they're not going to be open to that so the way that I do it is I say do a lot of kids at your school vape um, because then it's kind of just talking about it in a general sense and and I find that teens like to talk down about their school in general and so um just like yeah there are oh my gosh there's so many kids that vape at my school um is something that that i'll frequently hear um 
uh, because then it kind of talks better about them uh, themselves. And so that is a way that then I can kind of approach it from the side. Like they already know I'm going to say like vaping isn't good for you, but I've, I've kind of met them where they are rather than just saying like, you shouldn't vape or are you vaping? You need to stop vaping. It's bad for your health. You could get lung cancer, blah, 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 blah. Instead, you just kind of approach it from the side. Um, and then they're, they're more open and are more able to hear you. That is a perfect example. And one of the things that I do in the book too, is you said like, they like to kind of be talked down about their school. And I do find that kids like to have a common enemy. Um, mm, and so yes. oftentimes you can kind of play like, uh, play dumb about something, or you might say with regards to vape, like, so what, what's the situation with vape? Like I'm hearing about it on the news all the time. Do you think adults are just totally overblowing this or do you like, have you heard anything about the health effects? What do kids your age think right now about what's going on with all the media right. coverage of vape? And that's a way for them to be like, oh, I'm an authority. I know more than the media or adults and I'll tell you what I know about it. That's a great way to segue into a combo like that. That's a little bit controversial. Yes. And then you're able to kind of like interject your, your own thoughts and what you want to communicate to your child through discussing that kind of common enemy. Like you said, I like that concept too, because then you're not the bad guy. It's the media that really doesn't get it. And right. yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a great idea and it's kind of expensive and, and you, people might get in trouble if you do it. So I guess if, if, if I were in high school, I'd probably avoid doing that mostly because, um, you know, of, of those reasons or something like that, rather than if you vape, you're going to go to jail and you're never going to get into college and uh, we'll disown you. I mean, like, I think that's right. what that you, you feel like you have to communicate that message or when they do vape, then, well, I never told them in stern enough language that they shouldn't do that. I, I have the, I find that the same sort of um, conditions come up around talking about pornography or taking nudes, which is, you know, as early as middle school, a pretty big mm. issue. And parents mm -hmm. need to be talking to kids in middle school about taking nudes, sending nudes, asking for them. Um, and parents get really freaked out about it. They're afraid to put something on the radar. And oftentimes th the best thing that they can come up with to say is, well, you know, you can get busted for child pornography and you can go to jail for that. And kids are like, right. uh, uh, no one I know has ever been to jail for, <laughs> right. for sending a nude. So I'm um, right. now discounting everything you've said. If we can frame our concerns around their peer relationships, which is the most important thing to them, um, whether it's drinking or vaping or sending nudes, how will this reflect on your relationships with other people? So like, um, man, that kid who like drinks a ton and then pukes in his friend's car, like nobody wants to hang out with that guy. You know, <laughs> that, is right. a, that is a better sell than, you know, you can get arrested for it. They don't care right. about that much as they care right. about how they're perceived by their peers. So like, it's a real drag to be the kid who can never afford to do anything fun because you've spent all your money on vape or you are addicted and you have to do it all the time. And like, you can't hang out. You've got to step outside and do it all the time. Ugh. That's annoying. So I try to encourage parents to frame things that way. That's I, that's really wise too, because I think that that means a lot more to them. Because like you said, they don't know anyone that's ever been arrested or went to jail for these things. So they totally discount that you are an authority figure because you have taken the extreme, extreme um, outcome that's very unlikely to actually realistically happen. Um, and instead, you're focused on the, the, the effect that it could have on relationships. So can we dive a little bit more into the the um, like the nudes and, and photos and things like that? Because I think that is one thing where, where parents worry that they're going to mess it up. Um, or they're worried that they're going to introduce the concept as if their child didn't already know that that was a thing. And, and that's something that like... I learned in, in medical school, you know, it was like, well, you don't want to talk about suicide with a depressed person because then there that will inspire them to to do that when in reality we should be addressing that on a more regular basis realizing that we're not going to inject that into their head by talking about it we want to be able to be able to talk to them about where they're at and i think the same sort of thing applies with these topics that parents are worried like worried their where their middle schooler doesn't know about sex or alcohol or um, vaping or whatever it might be. And what if I bring it up and they never knew about it? How, how do I, how do we reassure parents that it's okay to bring up these subjects that, that you're, you're worried about introducing? Oh, I love this question. Um, it's, 
let's say in some magical world, there is a middle schooler who has never heard of sexting or sending a mm-hmm. nude. Okay. Um, there, like, so let's pretend that's the case. And then a parent is like, well, I don't want to be the one to say this to my kid. I, I can't imagine what the negative outcome of saying that to your kid is. Your kid's not going to go, huh, my mom told me there's a thing where I could get shirtless and take a photo of myself and send it to someone. So I guess I will. Like that right. is never going to be a child's reaction to being educated about this. They're not, right. they don't want to do anything that you talk about. So at least <laughs> this. Right. Um, so don't, don't worry about putting something on their radar. That's not the okay. issue. Um, again, with the sort of hope and ultimate goal being you, your job is to keep the door open so your kid can come to you. Should they, misunderstand something that they hear you want them to come ask you about it should they be curious should that should they have made a mistake themselves or have a dear friend who's made a mistake because one of the main issues that comes up with sending a nude is that it feels common there can be a lot of pressure to do it a kid does it and then there's a retaliation from the same group of people who said this is cool this is normal and then they ostracize a child who's mm-hmm. done it because that kid somehow got caught. Right, right, right. Um, photos were leaked or whatever it might be. And then that person suffers terribly for being ostracized by their peers. So you want your child to, should they know a friend who's suffering like that? You know, it, I'm not saying every kid is going to be asked to send a nude or contemplate sending a nude, but they are going to be in an environment where this does happen around them. So you want to position your child to be helpful and supportive Um, I think it's really key for the conversation around this to not involve any judgment or shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parents should be very, very careful that any conversation that has to do with sex, sexuality, identity, anything like that does not commingle with uh, bad feelings about themselves. So a kid who does this has simply made a mistake or been impulsive or Mm -hmm. uh, a risk taker or whatever it is. I like for the conversation to be framed more around that. And then what can you do to be supportive of a kid who's done this? And if you, again, if you talk about it as if it might happen to someone else, the lessons will remain true should it happen to your child, right? But they are far less likely to talk about the possibility of it happening to them. They're going to do what a kid in your office would do if you say, do you vape? Heck no, I never would, right? Right, right. So if you have the conversation with your kid, like, look, you, uh, I don't want you to ever send a nude photo of yourself. It's really terrible. Terrible things can happen to you. Um, you'll be mortified. It'll look really bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's not going to go over as well as here's how you can be a supportive friend should this happen to someone you know, and then you can talk about it that way. That's another tang- tangential sort of way of approaching that that subject that I think would really resonate. So in my mind, what I'm thinking is, hey... Susie, I know that I heard that there was a child at a different school that had a really difficult time after they made this choice to sext a picture and it really hurt their reputation. And I want you to know that if you ever have a friend that that happens to, then we can always talk about it. We can help them and we can be somebody that, you know, that, that can, that can be supportive. And here's how we could support that sort of person, sort of thing. If that ever happens to somebody that, you know, and then you're kind of injecting into their head, like, well, there must be something that's bad about it or bad things could happen about it. And here's what support would look like. And then it well, my parents would be supportive of me if something like that happened. And I get the idea that I, that I don't want that to happen. Does that That, jive? That's yes, that's exactly right. And I do go into deeper detail in the book around Mm -hmm. having a conversation around what some of the ramifications are, you know, not the, you can get arrested for child porn, but really sort of understanding how a photo can get leaked, even if you really trusted a person or um, how that can make you feel down the road. So a lot of times, seems like, well, this is a normal thing that kids this age are doing, or I'm just a very curious person and I would kind of like to see how other people react to my body if I show it to them, Mm -hmm. or I love some affirmation. You know, I'm not feeling great and this might make me feel better. So there are a million reasons that a child might do this. Um, And the book talks through some of the 
um, bad outcomes that can come from that. But again, without placing shame, more just like, huh, let's think about this uh, ahead of time and anticipate what what the ramifications of a choice like that could be with that framework that you just so beautifully put around that of like, if you know someone who this happens to, you can talk to me. I'm a parent who's not going to judge about stuff. I know that things like this can happen from time to time. And all I want to do is be supportive. Awesome. Well, I really like your book. I think it's so important. And I really think that the focus, like, the, I mean, we do, you get into the specifics of the technology and sexuality and impulsivity and those sort of things. But I think it really, in a broad sense, helps parents to have a framework and script and, and way to form that relationship with their middle school or entering high school. So I think that no matter what conversations parents choose to, to focus in on from this, that, that it's going to be beneficial to them. So thank you so much. The book, again, is right here, if I can get it, 14 Talks by Age 14. And it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. I would suggest that anyone go wherever they buy books to to pick up a copy of this. I'm an audiobook person, and so that's how I, I like to consume things. And there's an audiobook too. Um, so that it's just such a useful resource for parents, even before they get to age 14, like to start these conversations and to lay the groundwork in much younger ages with their child. Terrific. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Well, thank you. I loved being on the show with you and it was just great to chat. Thanks for watching. Before you go, will you hit the thumbs up like button because that will make me feel great and it will make you feel great too. Hit subscribe so that you don't miss another episode. And if you have a question that you would like me to answer, just text me. It's 402-256-0768 and I will answer your questions live in an upcoming video. Keep up the good work.